I'm Matthew Schultz. I'm the CEO of Oshin Biotechnologies, and uh, we're a company building genetic medicines for health and longevity. And uh, uh, kind of fun bit of full circle here is the the first talk I ever gave about a kind of a life or health extension was at Sen Six in uh, Cambridge, so one of the old Aubrey conferences. So thank you for having us back. Back then, uh, I was working on building an app store for the human body, a way to make a a patient's own B cells produce therapeutics, the goal of being able to recreate the biochemical environment of youth as you age. And uh, it took 13 years, but it actually just got an open IND for its first rare disease application. So, uh, um, some, yeah, <laughs> reason to celebrate, and uh, so, some hard yards on the regulatory front for sure. But, um, so we started here at Ocean to go after aging itself um, more mechanistically. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen graphs like this. Um, but I, I think it's still useful to, to level set with it a bit. And that basically, you know, age itself is the master corollary for pretty much any malady you could think of. I mean, it, it sounds odd, but you have far worse odds of having cancer as a clean living 70 year old than you do a chain smoking 20 year old. And this isn't to say that your ill-spent youth isn't gonna haunt you later. It's just to say that like, age itself is this dominant risk factor. And so we wanted to go after aging as opposed to just the symptoms of it. And I know this is maybe a little controversial, but I don't think we're ever gonna cure aging with pills. And this isn't to say that we haven't gotten some mileage out of you know, small molecule medicinal chemistry. And I know people in this room are continuing to develop new compounds. And this is a good thing. But I don't think it's gonna get us where we need to go. And the reason for that is that the essence of life is really information, not chemistry. And I mean, monkeying with the chemical substrate of life is fraught with unintended consequences. It's why pretty much any drug you can buy today has a list of side effects that's longer than the intended effects. And I use an analogy, it's a little bit like trying to you know, debug Microsoft Word by changing the microchips in your computer. Like, you might be able to do it, but it's gonna break a lot of stuff. And so we need better tools. What we really need are genetic medicines, ways to interact with life in kind of its native language. And this isn't a new idea in the sense that you know, people have been wanting to monkey with DNA ever since they knew what the double helix was. But there have been significant limitations to doing this in humans, and most of them really come down to delivery. I mean, your body has a vested interest in not letting things monkey with its DNA. And so you can break down the, the kind of common in vivo approaches kind of broadly into these categories of viral and non-viral vectors. And on one hand, you have you know, viruses, which are effectively purpose-built machines to modify nucleic acids in, in life, and they are good at it. But uh, your body knows that they are and doesn't like them. They're expensive to make, they have limited payloads. You can only administer them once because you basically vaccinate yourself against the vector when you do it. And there's, of course, a ton of work going into trying to tackle all these problems today. If you go to you know, ASGCT or something like that, you can see hundreds of posters of people trying to engineer viruses around those problems. The, the other kind of broad category, though, are uh, lipid nanoparticles. So these lipid-based delivery technologies. And you guys all have very you know, intimate familiarity with these in that you know, the Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines were based on this technology. And they have some strengths in that they're far less expensive to produce. They're far easier, faster. Uh, they can have larger payloads. But, uh, but they really suffer from uh, tolerability and biodistribution problems. I mean, if you think about it, the, in the case of the vaccines even, the maximum dose they could administer is 250 millionths of a gram. And it's not that more wouldn't have been better for purposes of vaccination, it's that when they went to 300, they toxed out all their sentinel patients. And so it has a real limit. And when you, you can administer more than that IV, but uh, I'll, I'll show you later that it, it can go pretty sideways if the dose gets too high. So we basically based this company on a new kind of delivery technology, something called a proteolipid vehicle. And you can think of it in you know, kind of a basic sense of trying to combine the best attributes of the lipid-based deliveries with the best attributes of the viral-based delivery systems. And so I guess to understand why this is important, uh, it's, it's useful to know what went wrong with, say, the, the lipid nanoparticle-based delivery technologies. And, because that's effectively what this is. It's, it's a subset of a liposome. But, uh, but most of these things, like say the you know, MC3 or snout formulations, had to make a, a Faustian bargain of sorts with charge chemistry. In order to get into the cell, they have to be endocytosed, to be swallowed up. 
And once they're in the endosome, they have to escape the endosome. And so if you make them charged, like cationic, they can get into cells and get out, but they become wildly toxic when they accumulate. If uh, you take away that charge, they're perfectly tolerable, but they don't work. And so what we've done is basically uh, engineer this to rely on a, a fusion protein to enter the cell, to fuse with the membrane directly. And uh, that allowed us to remove all of those toxic lipids, all the, the charge chemistry that was so critical to the old way of doing it. So what happens basically is when the particle gets close to the cell, those little fast proteins there, they uh, will basically flip and they mix the lipid of the cell with the nanoparticle directly. So it never gets endocytosed, it goes straight into the cytoplasm and you get like all of your payload available. And I, I don't want to get too far into the academic weeds on this, but I will tell you something that makes it special. And uh, so I said this fusion protein is key differentiator from other delivery technologies of this class. And uh, it was uh, first discovered by a Canadian virologist named Roy Duncan. And it's interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, these reptilian uh, orthoreoviruses that normally infect the stomachs of alligators and birds are the only class of viruses known to science that are non-enveloped but have fusion proteins. And uh, the second is that it's super, super tiny. In fact, it took him several years to isolate it. It kept uh, running off the edge of his gel because he was looking for something much larger. I mean, you can see there it compared to the fusion protein or hemagglutin protein from influenza. And so the, the ectodomain of this is only about 12 amino acids long. And, uh, that means it can be effectively invisible to the immune system. It sits there, it's kind of lipophilic, burrowed into the, the layer of the particle. And, uh, and we can administer this for months at a time, for, for years at a time, monthly, to fully immune competent animals and not see any immune reaction to it. So the first real benefit of this change up is, is safety, uh, tolerability. And I know it's a little gruesome imagery here, but uh, this is uh, their mouse livers. And, uh, it's comparing the, the POV delivery technology against the standard kind of LMP. And you can see here that even at relatively low doses, the liver gets cooked. And here you're pushing the dose far higher and it looks perfectly clean. And as unpleasant as I'm sure that is, I don't think it's actually what killed them. All these mice died in 24 hours, or the LMP ones did. And uh, in fact, when it first occurred, we thought we had just messed up the study and we reran it and then they all died again. And, and so we started analyzing them, see what's going wrong. And this guy right here, the cytokine, uh, IL-6, it spikes about 100,000 fold. It's massive. And that's at a dose of just half a meg per kg, where running ours at 20 barely makes a bit blip. And so this allows you to overcome what is probably the, the second biggest issue, and that's biodistribution. If you, uh, you remember maybe the old days of Moderna, and they're talking, oh, we're going to cure cancer, we're going to do everything with these, it's going to be sweet. And they've basically been relegated to the liver and vaccines, because if you administer any more than what gets past the liver, you're going to destroy the liver. And, uh, um, and that's just kind of part and parcel to the chemistry of the delivery technology. So the first thing you'll notice here, though, is liver is way down here. I mean, it's below bone marrow, actually. And, uh, so the uptake of this particle is based really entirely on, on biophysics. It has, just has to get in close contact with the cell to work. And so you have tissues that have lots of vasculature and blood flow that get hit harder. But uh, this, uh, my goal for it was really that I wanted to have a flat biodistribution curve. I wanted to be able to hit every cell in the body and, uh, and do it more than once, which is you know, a pretty tall ask for anyone in the delivery space. But uh, this is about as close as we got to it. And uh, it, it's pretty remarkable what we can do. We can, you look at these uh, animals and you see expression everywhere. But uh, we can also change the formulation. And I won't go into this too much, but uh, we're always looking for new collaborators. So we have the ability to, uh, to target these by changing the formulations to different tissues and even adding surface targeting on it. Okay, so we have this really kind of profoundly powerful new tool for genetic medicine and a really broad mandate in longevity. And our goal is to basically go after this as, as far and wide as we can to, to build an empire. Like I, I didn't want to build a company where we'd have an asset and flip it. I, I want to build like a Pfizer for longevity, a hundred billion dollar company that can persist for a hundred years or, or more until we can actually make meaningful progress on these things. And so we've built all sorts of therapeutics based on it, starting in senolytics, which I'll talk about a little bit, but ranging to growing muscle, killing fat, building collagens, extracellular matrix proteins, uh, even kind of more exotic things like 
partial in situ reprogramming and growing telomeres. And it, you can really do a lot if you can tackle delivery. So I'm, I'm going to start with kind of where we started um, and then go on to talk about some of the newer stuff we're working on. But uh, as some of you probably know, we started as a Senalytics company. And this is largely inspired by the work done at the Mayo Clinic in the Buck uh, several years ago where they built a transgenic uh, mouse where they could put a caspase under P16 and basically kill P16 positive cells uh, with an otherwise innocuous drug. And the results were really profound. I mean, I'd say it you know, arguably launched the Senolytics space kind of proper. But uh, the problem with it was, is, you know, academic study, and it's kind of translationally useless. Like, you can't go back in time and modify your own embryo, right? Like, um, you can't genetically engineer yourself in the past. So we set out to build a tool that allows us to accomplish the same result uh, in a way that would be clinically viable. And so the idea here is that you inject the PLV's IV. They go everywhere in your body. They go into healthy cells, and they go into senescent cells. But uh, they will only activate inside the senescent cell. And we have kind of described this in layman's terms as killing a cell based on what it's thinking, you know, not what it looks like. And that's kind of an odd idea, but like a senescent cell knows it's senescent. A cancer cell knows it's cancerous. And, and not that it's sentient, but, uh, but that it's transcriptionally different enough that we can exploit it. And when you think about it, like in the case of cancer, by the time you realize, oh, I have cancer, a lot had to go wrong. Everything from like DNA repair pathways, tumor suppressors, immune surveillance. The cell is in a very different state than its healthy equivalent. And so what we did was we put a, a little genetic program where we had initially P16 driving caspase 9. And, uh, and so it would go into cells but only kill the target cells. And you can basically build really complex Boolean logic, uh, you know, following logic gates and code in DNA. And so you can, you can tailor this as much as you want. And it doesn't rely on things like the surface markers or metabolic attributes of the cell. So this just kind of want to pull these two concepts together. This is actually a, a slide from a cancer study we did, but uh, the cancer application. And here on the left, this mouse, uh, was administered this treatment IV. Uh, it was a PLV containing uh, luciferous DNA under control of a CMB promoter, really broadly active. And you can see pretty much the whole animal is lighting up. It's making firefly protein. And, uh, but the mouse there on the right, that one's the more interesting one. It got the exact same dose, the exact same route of administration, but n <clears throat> now expression of luciferous is restricted to uh, the synthetic P53 promoter we put together. And there's been a, a little tumor there implanted in its flank. And you can see that this is the only thing expressing it. So all those tissues got the same amount of DNA. It's just not turning on. And so this is kind of like, guess, if, you were to, if you were to paint a picture of it, the, the approach about targeting based on information instead of chemistry. OK. So a bunch of you have seen this, but uh, this is where we had started. Uh, it was a longevity study. Uh, there's 40 mice roughly in it. Uh, we started treating them at two years of age, so they're pretty old. And, uh, and what we did was we either uh, killed, well, here's the, the control, I guess, PBS. Um, and you can see, actually, that follows more or less a pretty typical decline. Like, uh, there's a black six mouse. Ooh, lost my confidence monitor. Not very confidence inspiring. Um, <laughs> it, uh, by two and a half years, 50% should be dead. By three years, they should all be dead. It follows that curve, basically. When you give them the P53 treatment, the cancer treatment there in green, you see this delta in survival and kind of old age, um, where for a while we cut mortality in half, but then it drops back down and they, they die more or less on schedule. The P16 one is basically a recreation of that Buck Mayo Clinic study, and it performs about as well, but this is something one could inject today if uh, one wasn't afraid of the consequences, um, regulatory consequences. Um, but uh, what I think is really uh, kind of exciting and unprecedented about this is that we can combine these treatments. And there wasn't a, a dual transgenic made. So now people had killed P53 cells and P16 cells, but they didn't have an animal that let them kill both at once. And uh, not, not that way, at least. And uh, here, we hadn't lost a single mouse by the time half the controls were dead. And, uh, and even some of the ones that died were sacked for reasons you wouldn't sack your grandma for, like, you know, uh, atopic dermatitis and that kind of thing. But uh, um, <laughs> the animal welfare groups are a little bit different than human doctors. But um, <laughs> 
So this, uh, this got us excited. It kind of uh, was the start of our Senalytics program. And so what we wanted to do next, though, was a much larger study uh, that would look for things that would be more clinically relevant. That study wasn't powered to look for the effects beyond survival. And so we did this much larger study with uh, Marco Malavolta's group in Italy and, uh, and our own scientific advisor, uh, Mar Marco De Maria. And the same thing that we started at two years of age, um, we trained them to do a whole bunch of different tests, and then we treated them once a month, uh, four different times. And then we watched them for a washout period. And the goal here was partly to look for things that could be clinically translatable, like a, an impact we thought would line up to a disease. And the other, though, was to try to understand the kinetics of this a little bit better. Like, what happens if you, you know, start it in old age and then stop it? How long does it take before it wears off, basically, or the, the ill effects return? And so the first thing uh, we saw, we, we took a group of them, sacked them, looked at them for senescent cells, and we are indeed, of course, knocking down senescent cells. And uh, this is actually uh, most pronounced in the kidney, which is great for us because our computative first target for this is a kidney disease treatment. But uh, so we're on target effective, knocking down senescent cells. Um, and then we started looking at uh, metrics of clinical and physical frailty. Because these are like things that are directly applied to people. So on the clinical side, uh, lower is better. The frailty side, physical side, higher is better. Um, but uh, the clinical side is basically kind of a subjective measurement. You look and say, does it have like hair loss? You give it a scale of one to three. You know, does it look like it has bad posture? You know, it's, a, it's a battery of, I think, 34 tests. And, uh, um, and the physical stuff are all measurable strength type of things. But uh, but you can see here that you actually get you know, statistical benefit from it, and then you can wash it out in the watch out as they begin to like close back together. And uh, what was actually interesting about this as well is that there was a significant uh, sex difference in this, that the, the female mice actually fared better than the males. They, in fact, drug the, they made it significant when you have the females in there. But, um, I, I will go over more of this, incidentally, at uh, ICSA at the end of the month. If anyone is attending this, it's a more focused uh, technical uh, senolytic conference. But uh, so I'm just doing a couple highlights of it for, for now. But uh, when any mouse died, we did necropsy on them, tried to figure out you know, why they died and noted any other pathologies. And one thing that was really interesting here was that the incidence of cancer was massively reduced. You can see it there, it's huge. And uh, we attribute this to really a genetic overlap between senescence and cancer. I mean, after all, these senescent promoters we talk about, like P16 and P53, there are tumor suppressors. And so, uh, and we've definitely explored the use of the treatment for cancer. But uh, it was interesting to watch just as life would progress that, uh, that you had this huge reduction. And, but also, it didn't go to zero, that there's cancers, of course, that are not treated by it. Okay. So now uh, on to some of the fun stuff. Um, new stuff, I guess. It's all fun stuff. Um, but we, <laughs> we've been really pushing over the last couple of years to build out the platform aspect of this more, to, to not just focus on the analytics. And one of uh, my favorite projects is this one that makes you build muscle. And so what we're doing is we're expressing a protein called folostatin. And folostatin is basically the biochemical pathway for skeletal muscle exercise. It's uh, what's produced when you exercise, and it makes muscles get strong. It inhibits uh, myostatin, something that makes you weak. But in this case, we took uh, mice that are just six months old, um, so they're adults, but not ancient or anything. And, uh, and we injected them one time with this. And then we followed them out for about a year and just measured all their strengths. And, uh, and the goal here is, I mean, you think by the time you're in your 80s, you've lost about 50% of your muscle mass. Like, physical strength is everything as you get old. And uh, what we really want to do with it, actually, or at least the kind of first idea on it, was to use this as a prophylaxis of sorts for a hip transplant. So you treat a patient before they underwent the procedure. And so they put on more muscle beforehand, but also when they were immobilized, they wouldn't lose the muscle. And the results were really impressive. After about a year, these things were 50% larger and twice as strong. And, uh, and we didn't put them into the gym, although we actually have been uh, putting some monkeys into the gym recently, but I, I don't have data for it yet. But uh, this is just them being normal mice. And so it, it's gotten us really excited. Like, so we're hoping to have that. We just finished up our uh, talk studies and primates on it, and uh, we're going to have first regulatory interactions on it pretty soon. It's also actually already been optioned by a pharma company, which is super exciting, especially given it's kind of early stage. 
Um, a little more on the science side of it, we also did this locally, um, not systemically, to just be able to use a contralateral control in the animal. And you can see, I guess what you'd expect, the muscles get bigger, they get stronger, the myofibers themselves get larger, which is typical for that kind of treatment. And, uh, and so we're, this is a, a drug really that has been, people have been interested in it for a long time. And it's become a, it's a bit of a boneyard, I suppose, in pharma, and that it has a short half-life um, it's expensive to make recombinantly and kind of impractical to administer. And so it really, I think, relies on these kind of genetic medicine approaches. Uh, and some people have tried to make fusion proteins with it to make it live longer, but, uh, but I think this is really the way one would want to do it. And we can make it relatively inexpensively. You get, get your shot and, uh, and you're good for years. The uh, other thing we've been after recently is a, a suicide gene therapy for fat cells. So it selectively kills adipocytes. And, it might seem that I'm getting awfully vain here, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but I think there's a real impact in this in metabolic disease. And we, uh, the, the plan actually is to start in a rare uh, disease, a lipedema, where you get like abnormal fat deposition, um, but, uh, and then move, like basically license it out for cosmetic use and use that to pay for all of our longevity stuff. But the, the goal going further is to actually build a target visceral fat selectively, which is <laughs> proving to be not as easy as I thought. But, uh, um, but then you could basically not have any of the real cosmetic exterior outfits, but all the, all the metabolic benefit. And uh, this is some of the first work we did on it. Uh, we actually took uh, human tissue explants. So these are from like a tummy tuck type of procedure. They like cut out the extra skin. And uh, in this case, they punch it out like little cookie cutters and send it to us. And uh, we could inject it, you know, full thickness human skin and fat and see what it did. And, and we could kill, like, with the first version of this, about 20% of those fat cells uh, without causing any damage to the other tissue. I think that's really significant. I mean, you, you'd think of this a little bit as like, you have lipo with no trauma. Like, you can administer like a millionth of a gram to a tiny bit of fat or wipe out my whole beer gut. Um, it's a, it really has a huge amount of flexibility. Okay. So more broadly, we built this platform to make proteins in pretty much any tissue you would like. So uh, we can express from a, a local area, modulate certain behavior of cells. Like I said, we're, we're doing all sorts of kind of wild stuff with it on the research side. And uh, I guess before I wrap up, because I want to leave time for Q&A, uh, I'll just tease with this, because this is one of our kind of more exciting newer projects. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with these CAR T cell therapies, uh, you know, really powerful immunotherapies where you can redirect your own immune system to target tumors, but they're very expensive. They cost you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a dose, and, and millions of people could benefit from these, but they can only really make enough to treat thousands. And, but since we have a delivery technology that works inside the body, we can actually hit the T cells like inside of your spleen and your lung, your bone marrow, and, uh, and, and turn them into T cells, CAR Ts, temporarily. And I think this is like, a really exciting approach because if you follow the space, a lot of the optimism uh, stemmed from the thought that you might be able to go after solid tumors with these. And so far, that's proven very difficult due to the toxicity of it. They've mostly been used in blood cancers. But uh, if you have one that's transient, that can turn off, then you could do things that are more ambitious or aggressive than you could if it was going to be jammed on forever. I mean, because in some respects, a CAR T therapy is basically giving yourself an autoimmune disease. Um, and so, I mean, even in the blood cancer context, you typically can't produce antibodies again. It, it wipes out the B cell lineage. But, uh, but with this, you could pulse it until the tumor is gone and then stop. And I will leave it there. Thank you all very much.